Well, good evening, everyone, or good morning, or whatever time it is as you are listening to this, because we're not live. This is a podcast. I am Peter. This is Crucial Conversations, and joining me, as always, is... I'm Kevin. Hey. So, Kevin, we've been doing a series on Christology, right? Yes. Do you, do you remember that? It's, it's I do. It's been a while, it's, but yes. Yeah. Once again, you like left the country to avoid doing a podcast, and then you almost yep. left the country to avoid doing another podcast. Let's but, let's be clear. I left the continent. Yeah, you you do that a lot. I mean, podcasting yeah. isn't that painful, is it? Really? No, but you know. <laughs> so, in this series on Christology, we we've we've hit a a nice pause point if you will but we also wanted to kind of wrap up the current iteration of it i'm like making up words as we you, go you are just making stuff up yeah oh, well. the the point being we're we're kind of going to move into a different direction but we didn't want to just leave it hanging um with with no resolution and so we kind of want to do a little bit of a wrap-up episode on the christology series not because from now on christology won't enter into it but because this is kind of the, it, it won't be a formal, all right, we're going through the series kind of thing now. And we want to do something, well, it's, it's not actually different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that That's the thing with doing a podcast where we're doing our best to point you to Christ is that in many ways, we do the same thing every time if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. So we're continuing to do that same thing today. And we're going to talk about how to see, how to develop eyes that see Jesus in all of Scripture. Uh, I, I think it's it's easy in one sense to see Jesus in the New Testament because, well, there's his name, Jesus, the Christ, Messiah. It's it's kind of all over the New Testament, especially the Gospels. It's hard to miss Jesus there when he's named. But in the Old Testament, he's not named, at least not in that way. And yet he's still there. He's still present. Um, and Kevin, I'd, we didn't talk about this earlier, but I was thinking it can be easy to miss Jesus in the epistles, especially when you get to the parts that talk about or that seem to focus entirely on what you must do. Um, we tend to miss Jesus there, too, because all of a sudden we think, ooh, it's finally about me. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. lots, lots of different ways to to miss Jesus. And we want to make sure that we don't do that. And so as the wrap up to our Christology 101 part one, I don't know whenever we come back and add to this again, but as the current wrap up, that still doesn't make any sense. No, Kevin, what am I trying to say? You're trying to say that we're going to move away from the <laughs> addressing the church's historical teachings that are described by the term Christology but we're never going to leave behind the discussion of who Jesus is because it drives everything we do. There you go. Wow. Okay. Can we just end right there? I mean, there it is. And we're done. That, that was it. Thanks for listening. <laughs> crucial conversations at crucialproductions.org. The, the end. If you have any questions, send yeah. them to questions at crucialproductions.org. We've got our, just kidding. Don't ask. go away. We're kidding. Well, no, I'm just doing the questions now. That's a good, good uh, little moment to do that. Hey, we had somebody start supporting us last week too, which was kind of cool. Somebody said they appreciate the podcast and went to the website, crucialproductions.org slash give and gave us a gift. It was, it was nice. It was awesome. That's so great. If anybody else wants to do that, we appreciate that as well. As long as you're given to your church first, because that's the important. That's one. cool. Yeah. Okay. So Kevin, what are some of the things that you look for? as you're reading through scripture to point you to Christ? <clears throat> well, not, nothing. Um, I don't look for things. Ooh. Yeah. And that's, I there's think, a twist already. Well, there's not a twist. It's, it's, this is kind of the point is that I think a lot of people, when you say, Oh, the whole Bible is about Jesus. Their first question is, okay, how do I see him or where do I see him or what do I look for? that I can say, oh, there's Jesus in the Old Testament, or there's Jesus in the epistles, or there's Jesus, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of, yeah, 
okay, good. We can we can help you out a little bit with that. Um, when you look at the Old Testament, one of the things people say is, whenever the angel of the Lord appears, pay attention because often the angel of the Lord is later called the Lord. And when that occurs, you can be certain that that's Jesus or the second person of the Trinity, the pre-incarnate Christ showing up in the Old Testament. I like to say whenever God shows up physically anywhere, that's Jesus. I, that's I like to say book. when I'm reading the Psalms, whenever it says steadfast love, that's Jesus. Or or in the Psalms, if someone is doing really good stuff, sure. right? That's Jesus. Yeah. Okay. So it's those kind of things. We can do that. But but today I want to discuss something kind of a little totally entirely different, but the same. <laughs> and and what and that that's is, why this is fun. That's why, yeah, that's why this is fun. So, <laughs> and what that is, is that Jesus is God's activity to save mankind. And I just want you to think that for a second. Just think mm-hmm. through what that means. Jesus is the culmination of God's activity to save mankind. Now, read the entire Bible and you will see that it's actually all about Jesus. See, in the Old Testament, you really do read the story of God acting to save his people. And what you have to remember is that the Old Testament begins with Genesis, which The reason the Old Testament begins with Genesis is because that's the first book. And the reason it's the first book is because it starts by saying... In the beginning. Right. So we thought, well, we'll put that one in the beginning, right? (laughs) So that makes sense since since it literally starts in the beginning. We thought, well, we'll begin with the beginning. So it's the first book of the Bible. And what it does, it establishes that God is the creator of all things, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy. Yep. And and as you read the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2, what you find out is is the part of creation that we're going to talk about for the rest of this book is primarily, not exclusively, but primarily human beings. Right? Okay. And that every human being has their origin in God. It's, it seems kind of silly, but to make just make the point that there aren't any stories about particular mountains and how they were created. So when, when, when you say it's about human beings as opposed to what? Like, what, yeah. what else would it be? It's, well, it's it not about kind of obvious, but. Well, I mean, in today's world, people would probably be offended that it's not about dogs because, you yeah. know, those are, <laughs> those are my grandchildren too, you know. Right. And those kinds of things. <laughs> and what happened is, is, but that's not really something the Bible taught that Jesus didn't come to save dogs. I mean, mm-hmm. okay. He came to reconcile the entire creation. Yes. And we'll get there. But, right. but the primary focus of scripture is that he came to save mankind. And as we talk about this in the Old Testament, remember the focus of the Old Testament is God's activity to save his people. And the reason we start with Genesis is because Genesis teaches us that the entire earth and all the people therein were created to be God's people. Hmm. Right? Yeah. So... When we're talking about God saving his people, that's all people. And what we find is the way that that plays out in the Old Testament is that the earth itself falls because of man's sin. And then mankind itself turns away from God so that we create two different kinds of people on the earth. We we have those who believe in Yahweh, who call upon the Lord's name. Then we have those who don't believe in God and who call upon their own name. And that now, then, now you're giving away our Genesis and right, five, which right. which we've just had recording issues with that, but it'll be out next. It's coming. That's right. <laughs> it is. It's the beginning, so it's coming um, <laughs> eventually. And but what happens is then, as we read the Old Testament, we find out that God works to save those people who believe in Him. He continues to work to save them. They 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 sin. Right? They're not sinless because they believe in him, but right. because they believe in him, they receive his gracious action to save them throughout the Bible. So in Abraham, there's promises to save. In Noah, there's promises to save. In Jacob, 
and Isaac and Jacob's sons. There's promises to save and God's activity to carry that out. And then that all leads us up to the book of Exodus, where the most important story of the Old Testament is God's action to save his people from their slavery in Egypt, right? Yeah. Yeah. God's activity to free his people from slavery. That's the most important action in the Old Testament. And that's God's constant refrain throughout the Old Testament and even into the New Testament. Jesus references this, that I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. I mean, this is referenced throughout the entire rest of Scripture until Christ's death on the cross. Right. right. So that's who God is. Yeah. So so what what we're getting at here is when we say, okay, so now you're going to read the whole Bible, really, that's really the story about God's activity to save his people in Christ. Mm-hmm. So what you see is this Old Testament action of God to save his people, it is all pointing us ahead to the death and resurrection of Jesus. So even as you read the story of the Exodus of God and Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh and the plagues and the Red Sea crossing and the rock in the in the desert and the manna, it's all With, actually the and story. The judges and the, the judges, judges, all of that. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And and what you learn is that this is all the story of God acting to save His people. And that story is consummated, fulfilled in his son, Jesus Christ. So where is God, where is Jesus in the Old Testament? He is in God's action to save his people. Did we just do uh, the Old Testament in five? Did yeah, we pretty much. Well, we kind of we kind of didn't get to the exile, right. but, but the well, same yeah, thing. But <laughs> so <laughs> coming soon to a Bible in five series near you. So what happens is is then when you're when you're reading the Old Testament, and I'm not putting some of these things down because these are good activities. Sometimes it's good to highlight things in your Bible. Like go through and find all the times when God shows up in the Old Testament physically and say, okay, that's Jesus. Mm-hmm. You can highlight that, maybe make a mark in your Bible or something if you want to, if that's the kind of stuff you like to do. That's fine. And I'm not putting that down. That's a good thing to do. But I also encourage you to to read it without finding the specific phrases and just read it as every time we see God acting to save his people, you think, oh, that's fulfilled in Christ. Hmm. That's a prophecy of God's action to save in Christ. Uh, so, So we're looking at it, we're seeing it as incomplete. It's not the full salvation, but it's something that points us forward that indicates there's more coming. Right. Yes. Okay. Right. So, so when you read the Old Testament, those actually those actual historical events did occur, right? Yeah, definitely. And and they were a benefit to the people at the time. Right. Yeah, that's that is a there there are some odd places theologically that that people can go, and we got to be careful that we're not saying it only points to Christ and there's nothing else going on. We're saying it's it's the both and. It's just not fully complete. Well, it's the judges. We've talked about this before um, on the podcast, but as I'm reading through judges with my family and you know, here's these judges, but after each judge, the people fall into sin again and you have to have another judge that comes and right. goes through the whole cycle all over again. That's not telling us that God has failed. It's simply telling us there's more to come. That perfect salvation has not yet been accomplished uh, in Christ. That is coming in the future. But in the meantime, God doesn't just leave his people in their sin and just let them wallow in their own filth, uh, if you will. He he comes down and he sends a savior even then to save them in that moment. Is that a right way of thinking about it? Exactly. And and the fact that it's repeated. I mean, just think about the idea that God <laughs> yeah. repeatedly saves his people. That's what in the New Testament we call grace. Mm. Okay. God is not saying, I'm only going to save you this once and then we'll see what happens. Well, he, he kind of does. And then when they fall away, he's like, okay, I'm a God slow to anger and abounding and steadfast love and faithfulness. So I will continue to love you. Right. And I will continue to send you judges. 
Mm-hmm. And and that's kind of the point. You have this pattern of repentance and continued grace in the Old Testament pointing us ahead to the one sacrifice once for all that saves, but that once for all sacrifice is repeatedly poured out in our lives, right? It's not a one-time gift and then we're kind of stuck if we mess it up. No, right. we receive absolution daily because of Christ's death and resurrection. We receive the promises of God's grace daily, right? Yeah. Because of the one-time sacrifice. So we receive the Lord's Supper weekly. Why? Because Christ said, as often as you do this, right? So this is not mm-hmm. a one-time gift. This is a continual grace. God's grace in Christ accomplished once for all on the cross and in the empty tomb, right? It, it returns upon us by his grace because we keep on sinning, he keeps forgiving. So that's part of what you're also reading in the Old Testament. I mean, let's be totally blunt. Even if you don't ever read the Old Testament, just thumb through it. There's a lot there, <laughs> you know. Thinking, we haven't even talked about the kings and right. the prophets. We haven't gotten to the, the monarchy. Whole... We haven't got yeah. to the divided kingdom. We haven't gotten <laughs> to the prophets. We haven't gotten to the exile. We haven't gotten to the post-exilic t- time period before the New Testament is even written. I mean, all of that stuff we haven't talked about yet. But again, as you read that, as you read through the prophets, which are admittedly difficult to read sometimes. Mm-hmm. Listen, watch for God's activity to save his people and say, oh, there's Jesus. There's Jesus active in the Old Testament, and there's God saying there's a greater fulfillment yet to come, which will be in his physical death and resurrection. And that's the thing about the prophets. Even in the darkest prophet with with the worst news, whatever the prophet that has the worst news for his people, where it's just, look, everything's going to be bad for a really long time, and that's that's all there is to it. There is always still God's promise of saving his people, either in carrying them through it, or that pointing directly to Christ forward in time, or, I mean, any number of ways that God is acting to save his people, whether it's in the midst of their suffering or pulling them out of it. So when we talk about the, the prophets are hard, to read through, that's, I, I find it helpful to say, yep, okay, that's hard to understand, but you can still find verses or entire sections where here's that promise. Mm-hmm. Here's where Christ shows up and, and he's saving. And it's, uh, in one sense, it helps, <laughs> it helps the rest make a little bit more sense. It's like, okay, God, you're not going to leave your people in this because that doesn't seem to be who you are. Mm-hmm. That's right. So, so the first thing we want to do is as we read the Old Testament, anywhere God is active, anywhere he is active to save his people, you're going to say, okay, that is, that is driving the story to Jesus, right? That is showing me God's activity to save in Christ, and that will be fulfilled in Jesus. So then you say, okay, well, what about individual things? And that's when you go back and you say, okay, now you could look for what's called messianic prophecies, hmm. okay? So yeah. there, are, there are promises. You think of Deuteronomy 18, when a prophet like you will arise from among your brothers, the one who is greater than Moses, and and that's fulfilled in Jesus. You think of Isaiah 53 with the, the suffering servant on the cross. That's obviously Jesus. You think in Psalm 22, my God, my Psalm God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My God, my God, <laughs> why have you forsaken me? That's, that's Jesus. You think about um, the Passover lamb or the lamb who is, or the ram who was sacrificed instead of Isaac. Those are prophecies of Jesus. You think of the entire sacrificial system then. So then you get, so you, those are kind of the individual promises and figures of the Old Testament that are fulfilled in Jesus. But you also get large ideas like the entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament, <laughs> yeah. the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins, the the appeasing of God because of our uncleanness, right? The, the movement to sacrifice an animal because I'm unclean. Well, that's all fulfilled in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Well, and it's all the same salvation language that we use in the New Testament when we talk about Jesus. So this this unclean, you need to be washed. Your mm-hmm. sins need to be washed. Uh, there needs to be a sacrifice for your sin. All the all that language that is spoken of 
regarding the sacrificial system in the Old Testament is the exact same language used when talking about Jesus in the Gospels. When he begins talking about himself and what he's going to do, he's using the same language, and then the New Testament continues that on. And so that, when we're talking about those big ideas carrying all the way through Scripture, that's one way to notice them as well. Look, the language about the sacrificial system, it's the same vocabulary, the same language being used about Jesus himself. Right. And so as we go, the sacrificial system is one of those things. Another place where the language is similar is think about the tabernacle, right? God's mm. dwelling in the midst of his people. Well, then John 1 14 says, when Jesus took on flesh, he tabernacled among us. That's the verb he used. He, he built, he's yeah. pitched his tent, right? So that's <laughs> the that's actual a, word. It's the actual word. Um, yeah. You think about even the temple. Well, the temple is a prophecy of Jesus. What do you mean? Well, in John chapter two, you know, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. Uh, and nobody knows what he's talking about. And John says, well, after his resurrection, the disciples were like, oh, when he said temple, he meant his body. <laughs> yeah. Right. In John chapter six, it's talking about the pa- the feast of the Passover. In John chapter seven and eight, it's talking about the feast of the tabernacles or the festival of booths. And so you have these two, there are three Jewish festivals that you had to go to Jerusalem to celebrate. You have the feast of Pasto- Passover, the feast of weeks, which we call Pentecost, and the festival of booths, which occurred basically in October-ish. Well, in John 6, 7, and 8, two of those three festivals, Jesus tells us he is the fulfillment of those festivals. Hmm. And then in Acts chapter 2, we realize that that Pentecost is now fulfilled because the Pentecost is the celebration of the harvest, right? Mm -hmm. So then, so what we realize is that in Acts chapter 2, Pentecost is fulfilled in the giving of the Holy Spirit so that the church can proclaim Christ crucified. So, mm. so now we have all three Jewish festivals fulfilled in Christ, in his death and resurrection, in the proclamation of Jesus for forgiveness of sins. All the Jewish festivals are fulfilled in him. So then when you read in the Old Testament, you say, oh, there's there's festivals, there's pilgrimages they're supposed to make, there's a sacrificial system, there's a tabernacle, there's a temple. Well, guess what? All fulfilled in Jesus. And you say, well, what about the land of Israel? Well, guess what? That's that's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> to, but, to wrap your head around, at least. But but listen, but listen to what Jesus says. If you abide in my words, you abide in me. In John 14, in my father's house are many mansions, right? I go to prepare a place for you. That's a place to live. That's the land. And so what happens is Jesus actually is the fulfillment of the land. What happens? You're baptized. You're baptized into Christ. Mm -hmm. John is, is especially fond of saying we abide in Christ. See, this is where we live for all of eternity is we live where God is present to save us in Christ Jesus. So Jesus is even the fulfillment of the promised land. He's the place where we dwell with God. He's And, and I think, sorry, something that's helpful with that is if you contrast that with, if you if you insist that the land has to be a physical land somewhere else, then realizing that, okay, then you're saying that in contrast to abiding in Christ. And and when you put those two together, is is it the land or is it abiding in Christ? It seems it's a little easier to realize, oh, wait, no, abiding in Christ is always better. Right. Being being in him is always going to be the better choice. And if that's how he's talking about life and the land and the home and all that language, well, let's let's go with that one over insisting on it must be Israel physically located somewhere. And and then as we bring the, as you bring that up and you think of like where is it better to live? Well, one of the reasons it's better to live in Christ is because he's eternal. And and any place we live on earth is not. Mm-hmm. So then yeah. this moves this discussion in yet another direction, which is <laughs> all of this is pointing ahead to the end times. 
Yeah. So when you read the Old Testament, another thing you're going to hear, especially in the prophets, is the discussion of what's called the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is fulfilled in Jesus. First of all, it's fulfilled in his incarnation, perfect life, suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension. That's the first way the day of the Lord is fulfilled, right? Yeah. But there's also a coming day of the Lord for us as Christians. And that's the day that we call judgment day. I was going to say, it's not the rapture. Right, not the rapture. It's judgment day. (laughs) And as we talk about dwelling in Christ and the promised land, remember the promise for us is that we will live forever where God is present with his people. That's what's going to happen after when Christ returns, new heavens, new earth, behold, the dwelling of God is with men. Mm -hmm. And that's where we will live forever. And that will be in Christ. See, this is what we're baptized into. We're baptized into Christ, and that's an eternal reality for us. So we know that we wait for his coming because now we still live with the effects of sin. We live with our own sin. We live with other people's sin. We live with the fact that death is, is going to happen to us. Uh, we happen to have a good friend right now that's that's supposedly in his last days, it appears. And, mm. and that's a sad thing for us, right? Yeah. But it's yeah. a reality. So we look forward to the day when Christ will return, the day of the Lord, and all of God's activity to save mankind will be finally consummated when Christ stands as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and death is finally defeated. Sin is eliminated and we live forever in Christ with God. See, and that is the promised land. It's in Christ. And, and so all of us now, all of scripture fits into that narrative that we just described. All of it. Okay, so now what my brain is doing is I'm taking the last bit of what we've just talked about, the in Christ, um, dwelling with God, God with his people, and taking those phrases and running them back into the Old Testament mentally and say, okay, is that the same narrative? So we talked about God's action to save his people as the way, but we can also take this in Christ, God with his people, run that back through the Old Testament and see that consistently. I'm doing hand motions now. It doesn't yeah, I know. At all Is that fun? My, you can tell that I'm moving my hands one way, can't you? And just moving that narrative all the way through scripture. And we see God with his people all the way through scripture as well, now fulfilled in Christ. So we can talk about it is it accurate to say that it's it's the same thing when we talk about this in Christ in the New Testament and new heavens and the new earth, it's the same thing as it's always been, but just with the pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament. But apart from that, it's we're we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, I mean we're kind of kind of. Um yeah. So we're talking about the same God who acts in the same way to save, but his same actions to save are different over time. Ah, uh, okay. Isn't that that's, weird? I, yeah. Yeah, that's and I was looking, I knew there was a nuance there somewhere. It's like, okay, where is that where is that difference? So so what happens is just take like the manna in the wilderness. God fed his people by sending the manna. Now, that is a prophecy of Jesus as the true bread that comes down from heaven. I'm not making that up. Jesus told me. Yeah, he actually says that. Is it John? It's in John 6. six. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> Which you just went through in the Bible right. study. So if people want to go back go to our listen. Bible study, yeah, Bible do. study at OSL in the podcast feed. Yeah, do out. listen. But, but see, the point is, he actually did feed those people and it was a benefit to them. Mm-hmm. But Jesus himself says, but that wasn't the point. So, so we're not negating the history of the old Testament. We're not negating the truths of the new Testament. What we're saying is Christ is the point of all of it. He binds it all together. He is the fulfillment. He's the focus. He's the goal. He's the beginning. He's the end, right? So what we want to do is, is 
all of the ways that we think about God, we want them to be grounded in Christ. Hmm. When someone says, do you believe in God? Your immediate answer is, I believe in Jesus. I thought because, you were going to go into the second article of the creed, right? Article of the creed. Yeah, and that's a good way to do it. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Of course, I do. Yeah. I believe in yeah. God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Right. I mean, we got yep. it. We're, we don't have to make these words up. But the point is, is that when you think about God, don't think about philosophy. Don't think about an eternal being that's undefined and kind of has all these attributes of eternality and omnipresence and omniscience, omniscience and omnipotence. Don't Which think is how that philosophy wants you to think about right, <laughs> or or a God who is who says he's love but kind of acts weird. You know, no, no, no. Don't don't do that. When when you think about God, run to Jesus. Mm. This is who God is. This is how God shows me who he is in his son, Jesus Christ. This is, this is really the key point to the New Testament is that Jesus shows us God. He is God in the flesh. He is the revelation of who God is. He gives us access to his heavenly father. He gives us access to our eternal dwelling place with God. And he is actually God for us. And this leads to the next part of the whole equation. So now we've talked about God acting to save his people. Well, here's the question of the New Testament. Are you included in God's people? Hmm. See, if we've yeah. established that God has done all this to save his people and Jesus has done all this to save God's people, the question is, are you included in God's people? Because the Old Testament is pretty clear that God's people is Israel, right? Yes, yes. Initially in, the, in Genesis, he's got his individual guys that he's that he's handpicked, but that quickly spreads into the nation of Israel. That's his chosen people. But after Christ, it's like, wait, what happened to the Jews? They don't seem to be the central well, player and, in this anymore. And if he's the Jewish Messiah, what happens if I'm not Jewish? Right. What do I do? I have to become Jewish, but the Jews themselves don't seem to believe believe in him. So, does he not have a people? And and this is the question of the New Testament. So so Jesus does all of this to save God's people, and God is always acting in all of humanity or all of history to save His people. Are you included in God's people? And if you look at the evidence, the evidence shouts, well, "No." For me. Oh, I was going to say, uh, for me, yes, but not originally. <laughs> no, the answer, the, the, the evidence says no. Oh, okay. What are we, what evidence are we looking at, Kevin? If, I'm if you confused. look at my performance to oh. fulfill God's law, then I say, I have lived as I am not his child. Well, yeah, that's a clear no. <laughs> if you look at, since both of us are Gentiles, if you look at our, our lineage, it says No. no. If you look at the way others see me, if they were to be honest about me, they would all say, uh, no. <laughs> so what do we do here? I mean, if you look at, if you look at the status of my life, you say, well, you know, a, a child of God is going to live a blessed life and everything's going to work out wonderful. Then I say the evidence of my life says, I'm not a child of God. I'm not a child of God. I'm out. Yep. So Not here's so here's you. the question of the New Testament. Great. God has done all to save his people. Are you included in that? And and what is Paul's answer? Paul says the answer to that question is the same answer. The answer is Jesus. If you want to be included in God's people, then you are in Christ. And here's the thing. Just as all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, so also all are justified freely by his grace, which is in the redemption that is through Christ Jesus. See, Jesus is the one who says, all people, all people are now eligibly called the sons and daughters, but the children of God. Because I, he I died, throw it in I knew time. your Bible does, <laughs> but but he died for the sins of all people. Therefore, the grace of God is for all people. 
and it's not by works according to the Jewish law that you are saved. Mm -hmm. It's not by tracing your lineage to Abraham that you are saved. It's not by how good you've done fulfilling the natural law that you are saved. It's not anything about your riches or your accomplishments that says you're saved. It is simply God's action in Christ. That salvific action accomplished on on the cross and in the empty tomb, given to you freely by the grace of God. Which That's what determines who you are. And and this is also, the, it's once again, the common theme. This is how it was in the Old Testament as well. Exactly. God's people, God's people the Israelites, or Abraham, or Noah, or Adam, any of them did not make themselves worthy first, and then God chose them. No, he He chose them and then sanctified them and chose them and saved them. I don't know if sanctified was the right word there, but he chose them and then saved them all on his own. It's that same acting in grace towards his people that were defined by him choosing them, not by them doing something first and God taking notice and saying, ooh, hey, Okay, I'm, I kind of like the the direction you're taking that. Let me help you out. And that's why you go back to even the, the story of the creation of Adam. You say, it's not like Adam said, hey, God, would you create me, please? Yeah, <laughs> I'd like to be your first creation. Could, could, you, could, you, could you, help, you do that? Did you help a brother out? I'm non-existent. <laughs> yes. Could you do something? <laughs> no, I mean, that's kind of the point is, is scriptures portray mankind as being entirely reliant upon God. For everything, for our food, we call it daily bread, for everything, for love, Mm -hmm. for, for peace, for joy, it's all contingent on God. And the good news of the scriptures is God has done something to save us from our sins and to give to us eternal bliss. Mm -hmm. That action was accomplished by him in his own son, who is God in the flesh, who died on a cross and rose again, and now ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father, and will return. Mm. See, now, read the whole Bible, that's the story. And so, you see Christ in every action of God to save his people. And what you find out is that as you read the Psalms, you're reading a story about your savior. As you read the story of God saving his people Israel, you're reading the story of your savior. And as you as you read about sinners who don't deserve God's grace, but are saved anyway by a gracious God who loves them, guess what? You're reading the story of your life, that you are a sinner saved by God's grace because he loves you. Because he loved you before he even started this whole thing. Before Genesis begins, God loves you. He chose you. He predestined you to be saved in in his son, Jesus Christ. That's the story of scripture. And all of that is the crucial conversation. We'll talk to you guys next time. See ya.